Today's scripture oops, excuse me, is a reading from Genesis 27, 6 through 38, and also the New Testament reading is from Hebrews 12, 16, and 17. I'm going to start just a little bit before um, 6. To <laughs> <laughs> Now Rebecca was listening as Isaac spoke to his son Esau. When Esau left for the open country to hunt game and bring it back, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, Look, I overheard your father say to your brother Esau, Bring me some game and prepare me some tasty food to eat, so that I may give you my blessing in the presence of the Lord before I die. Now my son, listen carefully and do what I tell you. Go out to the flock and bring me two choice young goats so I can prepare some tasty food for your father, just the way he likes it. Then take it to your father to eat so he may give you his blessing before he dies. Jacob, what if my father touches me? I would appear to be tricking him and would bring down a curse upon myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, my son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. <laughs> So he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father liked it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and put them on her younger son Jacob. She also covered his hands with the smooth part and the smooth part of his neck with the goatskins. Then she handed her son Jacob the tasty food and the bread she had made. She went to his father. He went to his father and said, My father, Yes, my son, he answered. Who is it? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. Isaac said to his son, How did you find it so quickly, my son? The Lord your God gave me success, he replied. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Come near so I can touch you, my son, so I know whether or not you really are my son Esau or not. Jacob went close to his father, Isaac, who touched him and said, The voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him, for his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. So he proceeded to bless him. Are you really my son Esau? he asked. I am, he replied. Then he said, My son, bring me some of your game to eat, so that I may give you my blessing. Jacob brought it to him, and he ate, and he brought in some wine, and he drank. Then his father, Isaac, said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught the smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you heaven's dew and earth's richness in abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over all your brothers and your sons of your mother. May them bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed, and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac had finished blessing him, and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, please sit up and eat some of my game, so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? I am your son, he answered, your firstborn, Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? This is the second time he has taken advantage of me. He took my birthright, and now he's taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered, Esau, I have made him lord over you, and have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, father? 
Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. Second reading is from Hebrews. The New Testament reading today is Hebrews 16 and 17. See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. Prayer for illumination today. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may hear your word with joy. Bless Dana with clarity, so we may understand your word. Amen. Thank you for blessing me. I'll take it. I'll take it. Now, you've heard of uh, intellectual property, right? You can get taken to court for uh, stealing somebody's intellectual property. There was a church that was sued for holding hands at the end of the service and singing something like, you know, can't wait to see you again, but to the tune of Edelweiss from Sound of Music. And they, they got the lawyers after them. It's a real thing, intellectual property. What we don't have in our legal system is blessing property. It's a real thing, but you can't get sued for stealing somebody's blessing. You're just going to have to wait for the Lord to discipline you on that. But it's a real thing. Blessing is real. And the, as we just heard uh, Isaac say, well, he will be blessed indeed. He came deceitfully and took your blessing, and he will be blessed. This is what blessing is in the Bible. It's a word about the future. It's a positive word. It's these three things. It's a positive word that moves the direction of things to come. It's an authoritative word that has the authority to make these things happen. And it's a prophetic word that predicts the future. So a positive word. When I think of this, I think of Boaz in the book of Ruth. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but Ruth is this widow who just really... Uh, needs shelter and Boaz is this rich man who must have been ugly as a brick because he's single <laughs> and uh, but he was a good man because when he would go out to where his workers were working he would uh, say to them the Lord be with you he blessed them and they would say back the Lord bless you and that is a it's always caught my heart what kind of work environment you know to say the Lord be with you means you're going to succeed you can do it. To have a boss, the first thing they say to you is, you can do it, I know you can. That's a boss that you do anything for. So you say, the Lord bless you. I want you to get all this grain that I'm harvesting. I want you to get the wealth that I'm working for you to have. It was a good work environment. That touches my heart. That's a blessing. Another blessing, an example from our own life, uh, and I asked Bob just a few seconds ago, you know, if I could use it, is, is the blessing that Bob gives. This is just an example. It's a positive word that really impacts your future. Now, when people say goodbye, they might say, see you later, so long, uh, till next time, or peace out, or whatever. But Bob, when you're leaving, says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And when he says it, you can almost feel it coming. It's a blessing. And when you bless, when you speak a positive word of blessing, it creates an impact. It's a real thing. Uh, example from the Bible that's got a little bit more teeth than, than the story of Ruth is the encounter that Gideon had with the angel of the Lord, who we discover is God himself. Um, Gideon is hiding. He's in a, a, a green, uh, he's in a, uh, I can't remember what you call it, a wine press. He's in a wine press threshing out the grain because he's being bullied so bad. And all the people of Israel are being bullied that they can't make a loaf of bread without hiding in the bushes to try and get this wheat put together. And the Lord comes to him and, and says, the Lord is with you, meaning you're going to succeed. It's a, just an encouraging word and it's a blessing. So a blessing is a positive word that actually, because of the power of God, impacts your future in a positive way. And you can say it just as simply as saying, peace be with you, or the Lord is with you, and you can do it. A blessing is also an authoritative word. 
this same incident when the angel of the Lord speaks to Gideon, uh, the Lord says to Gideon, go in the might that is yours. He's hiding from the bad guys. He's being bullied. He feels like uh, two inches tall. And the Lord says to him, go in this might of yours, you mighty man. <laughs> wow. And then God says, have I not sent you? So God is saying, I have the authority to call you a mighty man if I want to. And if I do, you are. That's a blessing. It has authority. A blessing is also prophetic. And this is what we see in the passage we read today and later in the story of Genesis, especially when Jacob, who swindles the thrown away gift, when Jacob blesses the 12 tribes of Israel, his sons, who, who become the people of God, all the blessings are prophetic. And he says to Judah, this is Jacob when he's old and dying and he's praying over his children, like he just experienced as a child. He says to Judah, you're a lion's cub. You devour the prey. You hide in the bushes. You're, uh, you know, you're a mighty force to be reckoned with. And the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And we see in Revelation 5, 5, that Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. It came to pass. It's prophetic. It speaks about the future. It's positive, it's authoritative, and it's prophetic. And so what I have to, as a pastor now, is what I have to do is ask you, do you want to be blessed? Do you want to be blessed? Yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad you said yes. <laughs> <laughs> because if you were me, you might have been scared. Is that, well, can I do that? Is that okay? Isn't that what the bad churches do? Aren't, aren't, these, aren't these the churches that say, bless me, and it's, and it's bad, I'm supposed to not like that? Uh, no, 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 no. The Bible says you want to be blessed. It's good to ask God for blessing. Yes, ask God for blessing. Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 6. I read this in the New Living Translation, and my eyes bugged out. Now, the New Living Translation is sort of a paraphrase. It tries to put things into words we can understand from the Greek and the Hebrew. But it's talking about God's tremendous grief and anger over the people of God going to idols. And it says, you no longer ask for guidance or seek my blessings. I don't think I'll ever forget when my middle son, Caleb, in college said, Dad, what do you think? I just about fell out of my chair. <laughs> do you want my advice? You're not, you're not even 20-something yet, son. You're not in your 40s. You're supposed to wait until you're about 50 to think that I'm smart. <laughs> you know, doesn't it make a father's heart feel great when the child says, Oh, father, you know, what do you think? He asked for my advice and asked for my blessings. And deep inside all of us, there's a real craving to be approved of by our fathers. We want to be approved of. We want to be approved. We want our father's blessing. God says, I put that there. I want you to have that. Seek me for blessings. Uh, 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 another example is the prayer of Jabez, and I lazily didn't look up the reference, but it's in the first five books of the Bible, going through a list of names, so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so, and then pause, suddenly, dramatic uh, emphasis, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and he said, oh, Lord, that you would bless me. He's just craving that blessing the way Esau did, but it's not too late for Jabez. Oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. God says that's honorable. It's good. Yes, you want God's blessing. All right, good. We're all together on that. Now, here's the hard part. This is how you get God's blessing. This is what Jesus said about God's blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those, those who mourn. I know that this church has mourned. How can you be blessed in that? You know what that feeling is like. How's there any blessing in that? The blessing is that you come to God with that pain and then you have a, an experience shared with God that lasts to eternity. It's more valuable than the pain is painful. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, the persecuted. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You want to be blessed. 
You want to be blessed. Um, blessing at a point in time that's in the future sometimes comes by way of loss and lack and weighty and self-sacrifice in a time that's in the present. And that's exactly what the life of Esau has to share with us. That's what this message is all about. This is a story with a moral. There's a moral to this story. There's, there's more things than I have time to talk about, but these are four lessons from Esau's experience. Now, I'm going to say this is the moral of the story, but even as I do, it's, I think God wants us to feel the pain of these two brothers uh, having their relationship ruined. To feel what it's like to be Esau, to have your brother trick you, and to, to know the guilt that Jacob's going to feel and the fear that he's going to experience. It's a painful story about a broken relationship between two brothers. But these are the lessons we have to learn from it. Number one is that we ought to treasure what is valuable. We ought to treasure our treasure, what's really treasured. What's valuable is eternal. What's valuable is the character that God produces. Like Brother Al was talking about the sharp pencil. What's valuable is uh, the, the spiritual riches of our life in Christ and the fruit that God produces in our lives. That's valuable. Uh, so many simple little things get in the way uh, and become temporarily more important than that. That's what I preached about last week. Second lesson is that we have to master our flesh. And then I, I'm going to use a spiritual discipline as an example that the church has done for 2,000 years. It's fasting. Fasting. I like to eat. Has anybody seen me do it? <laughs> I like to eat. I love to eat. I loved eating at the fireman's barbecue yesterday. It was, it was just heavenly. I love to eat. Uh, but when you fast, you do something that's miserable. It's miserable to be hungry. And there's a couple of reasons that Christians do it. Number one is say, God, hello, pay attention. I'm freaking out over here. You've got to help me with this situation. I'm not going to eat. You've got to help me. The other reason we do it is to say to our body, now you sit down, body. You're not going to push me around. You're not going to determine whether I follow Jesus or not. You stand down, flesh. The spirit of Jesus Christ is in control here, not you. And Esau was famished. And he traded his birthright for a bowl of soup. I need to explain something that is evident, but, but not... Um, not uh, declared yet, uh, that is that the blessing goes with the birthright. The blessing goes with the birthright. In this messed up story, God unscrambles an egg because when Esau sells his birthright, he's also getting rid of his blessing. And he's thinking the whole time, little Jake's never going to get away with this. Dad loves me. But, you know, it's going to come along. I'm going to get the birthright. I'm going to get all the sheep, all the donkeys, all the camels. And, you know, it'll be fine. But the blessing goes with the birthright. He sold it with an oath. God honors those oaths. So, uh, the bowl of soup, it's just not worth it. So we need to master our flesh. And, and, and that thought leads into the next thought. The third, third thing we need to lead, learn from Esau is that we ought not imagine a lack of consequences for putting our spiritual life in a low position and thinking little of the life in Christ that God offers us and all that is called of us as followers of Christ. Now, um, I'm going to comfort you in a second here. <laughs> You're in the rock tumbler right now. You're getting smooth. You know, it only takes a few weeks in the tumbler. But, um, You know, one preacher put it this way, sin would have a lot fewer takers if the consequences were immediate. <laughs> All right, you, you nodded your heads in such a way that says, I don't need to say anymore. Uh, uh, the, the final thing that we need to learn from Esau is to run to the Father now. And here's where I want to say that as I'm sounding like I'm beating up on you, there's no perfect Christians. 
you, you know, when you're treasuring that which you ought to treasure, your faith, even if it's just the level of Christianity, there's no perfect Christians. There's just one perfect cross for all of us. All of us. And whatever little bit of mustard seed faith you have, you treasure that. Treasure the little bit that you have. But what Esau should have done, after he got up from his nap, you know, he ate the soup, he's like, oh, man, thank goodness, and took a nap, and then he woke up and came to his senses and said, oh, man, what have I done? I said this with an oath. I just threw away everything. He should have said, my father loves me. I'll go to him and say, Dad, I insulted you. Everything you were going to give me, I called it, you know, $8.95, a bowl of soup. I insulted you. I was so terrible to you. I'm not worthy of receiving this blessing. I'm so sorry. It was terrible. Uh, but if you'll please forgive me and, and negotiate and get Jacob to sell it back, I'll give him 50 camels for that bowl of soup. He'll still win. But just let me have my birthright back. He could have gone to the father. The father loved him. He was trembling. Oh, no. I wanted to bless you, Esau. Father loved him, and it's a word to us. The Father loves us. Run to him now in this life while we can. He loves us. He wants all of us to run to him. Those are the lessons that we learn from Esau. And, uh, you know, good news, when I practice this sermon, it's only 40 minutes long. <laughs> but we've come to the end. We've, and, and we have uh, the Lord's table and more worship and prayer. And so I need to wrap this up and just say that the the thing that we need to do in response to this word from the Lord is to humble ourselves. We want to be blessed. And you heard what Jesus said about who is blessed. We need to humble ourselves. There's a blessing that comes with that humility. It comes with the pain. It comes with the patience. It comes with all of the lowliness and meekness that Jesus commends to us as a blessing humble ourselves. And then I just simply have to say the Lord bless you. The Lord bless you. You know, human beings are the only animals that God blessed. Who would like to go on an airplane built by chimpanzees? <laughs> Chimp airline, you know, in case a lot of them, you know, the cabin pressure goes down, a banana comes down. And you, don't, you don't want to be on an airplane made by a chimpanzee. We're building skyscrapers. The chimps are beating their chests, and we're blessed. We're not just smart, we're blessed. God's intention is to bless you, and he blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth with my presence, you image-bearing wonders. So be blessed, be blessed, amen.